Okay, there you are. I'm here. <laughs> I could not find the link anywhere. Sorry about uh, that. Well, we wanted it to make it as intriguing and mysterious as possible. That's uh, my middle name, so. <laughs> Right. Exciting. Okay, so we're going to get going. I have to do a formal introduction first. So here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. I'm just going to jump into it. All right. Hello, everybody. And welcome to Chattable, Hollywood insights, stories, and overshares. Fingers crossed. Brought to you by the team at Actors <laughs> Comedy <Comedy Studios. laughs> She'll do it. She'll yeah. spill the tea for sure. Uh, brought to you by the team at Actors Comedy Studio, the world's only sitcom acting and writing school. I'm your host, Gunnar Rohrbacher. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Insta at Gunnar the Comedy Coach. Um, thanks for joining us. So what is Chattable? Chattable is a conversation series where we meet with notable guests from uh, all facets of show business. Our goal is to inspire, excuse me, it's the smoke, uh, and educate uh, with personal uh, inside knowledge and personal anecdotes. If we're lucky, we might get an overshare, also known as too much information, spilling the tea, or just low down dirty, dirty gossip. So our last guest, Fred Goss, did not disappoint, right? He named names. So uh, before we end our chatable, uh, uh, my conversation with uh, uh, our lovely guest today, I'll get some of your questions. I may not get to all of them. Uh, please drop them in the Q&A box uh, as opposed to the Zoom group chat, because uh, I'm not going to be looking at that so much. Um, and then I'll get to as many as we can, but otherwise feel free to comment away. Uh, it's a fun and formal and funny time. We do have a moderator on deck, Erin Coleman. She might be a mysterious voice uh, from beyond. Are you there, Erin? I can be both. <laughs> I can be a fake voice. Hi, Camilla. Good to see you. Please. And yes, I just want to remind you guys, when you're throwing stuff in the chat, make sure it goes to all panelists and attendees if you want to share your thought with the community. And if you just want to share your thought with our wonderful panelists, then you can click all panelists. Fantastic. That's clear to me. I hope it is clear to them. Erin's known for efficiency and uh, ultra clear communication. That's what so, I'm here for. Unlike me. <laughs> That's her jam. <laughs> okay, thanks Erin. If I do anything wrong, please reappear and let me know. Absolutely. Uh, Sure, you That's know. My goal in life. Okay, <laughs> I'm out. Have and, a wonderful chatable. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Kimbola just left. All right. So everybody, even though she just got up and walked away from the camera, today's guest is a dear friend of mine and someone that I cannot wait to get into a chatable with. Uh, Camilla Cleese, actor, writer, producer and stand up, and also, because I want to talk about this later, former professional equestrian. Yeah, that's a thing. Um, what do you have in there? Are you, are you sponsoring a product? I don't know if you guys have tried these, but if you're looking for a delicious low calorie beverage, they're really good and sparkly and refreshing and cheap, love them. <laughs> What I love about Chattable is I don't know what's going to happen until it happens. Like I literally just the, you know, prompted you into a commercial and you just yes handed it. <laughs> what can I say? They don't pay me, but hopefully after this, you never know. You never know, right? Uh, so, and then I'll get an agenting fee because I set you up for it. So it's a win-win-win for everybody. Uh, did I leave anything out in terms of your introduction? Because I'm happy to- I don't to think so. Time. I've certainly had- a lot of other jobs too, but I don't think we need to talk about my stint in housekeeping at a hotel. It just doesn't seem. Oh, <laughs> oh, don't we though? <laughs> I mean. That was one of my first jobs. And uh, whew, I always tip the maids when I leave because that is the worst job I've ever had. And I've had some other not great ones, but with the professional equestrian thing, I spent a lot of time cleaning up after horses and I would way rather clean up after horses than humans like any day of the week. People are gross. saying a lot. Yeah, yeah, especially because horses messes are a lot larger, but like at least they, well, I guess I was going to say at least they have respect. I mean, they're not cognizant of what respect is, but like they, they don't like have sex parties and leave it. Yeah. Right. They're, what they're doing is normal and natural and uh, not, uh, not 
uh, the end result of a series of probably very bad choices. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> depending on how you look at it, yeah. <laughs> or great choices. I'm sure they felt it's great. It's not my jam moment. either, but <laughs> sorry. I'm sure those choices felt great in the moment. I wouldn't, that's actually not something, even when I, before I quit drinking, that that was never my my thing. Uh, not a, no, you're not a party girl. No. Uh, I'm retired, is <laughs> what I'm saying. Fair. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so now, just for context, because uh, I absolutely want to be chattable with you, but in case any of our audience members didn't know, uh, you do have a heritage of comedy and you do have a very funny, uh, noteworthy father. Yeah? Yeah, Bernie Mac. Uh. <laughs> I love Bernie, I'm so sorry for your loss. I know, thank you, I appreciate that. Um. <laughs> I cried. I'm already getting canceled and we've been on for two minutes. <laughs> um, no, I set it up. You knocked it down. That was a good one. <laughs> I, I like to have a little fun with it. Um, no, another one that, that people may not guess, hopefully, because I don't think I look too much like him. Thank fucking God. Uh, <laughs> no, he's a very good, he's a good looking man, but he, he's a very, he's got an underbite. Let's just say that. Um, not, not a great look on a girl. Uh, his name is John Cleese. He was, you might know him from Pink Panther 2 or... Uh... Oh God, that's, that's my favorite. That's, that's actually when I tour with him, that's how I introduce him uh, in the shows. Because everyone in the audience, you know, there's two and a half thousand people. They know why they're there. It's not because of Pink Panther 2, but it gets a huge laugh. And then he's pissed off when he walks on stage. So it's perfect. Just it's a, win. a win, win, win. <laughs> throwing the history of Monty Python and its accomplishments right under the bus. Yeah. Well, Fish I called Wanda, it. Academy Awards, who cares? Mm -hmm. I just like that he was in a film with Beyonce, or as he says it, Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> he called me and he was like, have you heard of this woman named Beyonce? And I was like, Beyonce? <laughs> That's amazing. But he's British and authoritative. So I almost feel like he's right. Yeah. It's wrong. Well, he probably has the right pronunciation. Yeah. But I like to, I mean, I sound like this mostly to piss him off. Like I had a British accent the first half of my life. Did you not know that? I grew up there. Well, no, I knew that. Um, yeah. but it's just this accent is the only one that I'm used to, so. Well, I don't, I mean, I can turn the British on if I need to sound smart or whatever, but um, <laughs> I live in LA, so that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> yeah, so you wanna lean into the valley a little bit, because you know what? I think your number one priority as a female comedian is to not threaten men, so I hope you don't. <laughs> I mean, just being a female comedian, I think inherently you don't threaten men because you're like, I mean, the the shit that we, I can I swear? No, yeah, you, you, whatever, we'll let your hair down, do whatever. Um, I'm not going to do that because it's too hot. But uh, yeah, I, if you are a female in stand up comedy, I think you have to be a masochist because you're you. It's not easy. It's like. I love it. And I think it's one of those things you try it and you either love it or you hate it, but you're like, I'm glad I did that once just to, to see. Um, but then it like takes over your life and ruins it. And you know, <laughs> that's it. like, as much as I love it, when I look back, the sacrifices that you make are very substantial. Um, and the upside is, not a great deal <laughs> this that's not true i mean i will say that i would guess about 80 percent of the work that i book is because people know me from doing stand-up um i don't have reps right now i just almost everything comes to me directly uh so and that's because it's a great way to showcase yourself as a performer and a writer um but it's not an easy, it's not the shortcut. Let's just say that. I think a lot of people are under the, the notion that um, it 
is like a quick way to get discovered. You see a lot of actors doing it, you know, taking classes and they'll do like one stand up show. And I promise you, it's not the case because it, it takes so long to get good at it that by the time like you really have to be dedicated and put in the hours, there's no shortcut. Uh, there's no overnight successes. I think you'll notice like, you know, there's a lot of nepotism that you see in acting, like where, you know, an actor may give their kid, you know, Jaden Smith, a, a lead role in a movie and produce it around them. Even if it doesn't matter how talented you are, but if your dad's a stand up and he gives you a, a hour long special doing stand up, it's not going to be good. I mean, not to say that necessarily it's going to be great when an actor does it, but like, there's just no, you have to put in the hours and hours and hours because there's so many variables that uh, go into stand up that you have to deal with that take years to learn to deal with um, that you don't have to necessarily deal with if you have 20 takes and a great director and editing to sort of cover up if you're not killing it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you're pretty uh, naked and vulnerable on a stage with just you and your voice and yeah. the, craftsman, the craftsmanship of jokes. And we both know that it's, uh, yeah, it's not only the confidence that you have to build, but the architecture of joke yeah. structure. That's something that we talk about all the time as uh, comedic oriented people. One of the things that I, uh, on the long list of things that I love and appreciate about you is uh, you, you care very much about the DNA of comedy. Mm -hmm. And also, I think the humanity of it. I mean, that's been my observation, but let me turn that into a question. Do you have a philosophy about comedy? Um, well, I think it's, maybe I just tell myself this because it makes me feel better about my career choice, but I think it's so important to humanity in general, like to be able to laugh. And if we can give that to people, especially in times like this year, which fucking blows, like, I think it's been a great thing for people to have as an outlet because um, it's cathartic to be able to laugh about things. And I, I think one of my goals is, you know, they do talk about a lot like, uh, what is it? Pain plus time equals comedy. I might have just had that equation wrong, but like it's all this time. Yeah. Yeah. And like being able to laugh at those darker things like um, and find ways for people to relate to that and laugh with you, I think. That's like always been my ultimate goal. It's very difficult to do that sometimes, like um, turning the loss of a parent into a comedy bit. But I've I've started to get there where I'm able to do that. And I think people really kind of appreciate it because it, those things are tiptoed around so much, you know, like you, that it's like a taboo subject to talk about. But if people can laugh about it and, and appreciate that there are humorous things that come up during those times. Um, I think it's therapeutic for everyone. Well, it's a simple distinction, but an important one. Yeah. That loss, you know, we do experience tragedy and that's universally relatable. So it's not about making that funny. It's about finding the humanity that exists right. in moments that can exactly. be. Exactly. Like my, my mom passed away a few years ago and um, like, I'm not going to do a stand up bit about how my mom died because that sounds horrific and it's not going to be funny. But if you think about all of the aspects related to when she passed away, like um, using that as an excuse to get out of things and they're like, but Camilla, she died four years ago. Like you can't still use this as an excuse to get out of things like there's and that's not a joke per se, but like that's a funny angle on it or like the fact that I just realized I still have to log into her Facebook account and I could bring her back from the dead. Like, <laughs> to me, that's funny. <laughs> it's twisted as all hell, but like people, people can get on board for that. They're not gonna get on board for me, like literally laughing about my mom dying because it was devastating. It crushed me, but like being able to laugh at the funny things that happened during that time when she was not well. And then also like how you deal with it after the fact, um, that's where you can find the comedy, I think. But it is, it's is—it's a very delicate line that you're constantly tiptoeing. And with stand-up, you have to sort of figure it out as you go along. Like, you're gonna have, 
<laughs> the first time I tried one of those bits, it did not go well. And you just have to keep like the wording is crucial and the, the delivery is so important. And um, and that's another thing to emphasize with stand up. Like I know there's been a lot of stand ups that'll tweet something or like uh, Jim Jeffries addressed it in one of his specials because he does a, essentially a rape joke. And that's for 99.9% .9 of the time, that's not OK not okay at all but it is a really funny joke like he's a brilliant stand-up and he knew how to deliver it and it's not really about rape being funny by any means but he um basically says if he was going to get raped he'd want it to be by bill cosby because that's his childhood hero right <laughs> which it's terrible but he words it better he delivers it better but some newspaper picked it up and verbatim repeated everything he said in the set and it sounded fucking terrible. But like he points out that part of the skill as a comedian is saying these terrible things, but remaining likable because you know how to deliver them and your your the tone of voice. Like it, there's so much more to communication than text, uh, as I'm sure we all know. Because like, how many relationships have I ruined by text message? I've lost track. Like, because <laughs> sarcasm does not read in the text message. And like, I have like absolutely no impulse control <laughs> like this is kind of funny this happened yesterday this guy i've been seeing uh he just texted me a, like a heart emoji and to me like some people would just like heart back or and i'm like ooh. <laughs> so i scrolled through and after some deliberation i replied <laughs> with like one of the pregnant girl emojis <laughs> wait for it it gets better and then after like five minutes, I was like, oops, that was meant for someone else. <laughs> and thank God he has a good sense of humor because after I wrote that, like I was crying, laughing by myself. And then I was like, there's a very good chance that he never speaks to me again. Like he might just block me from this. But like, that's where comedy for me comes ahead of everything. Cause I'll like, I can't resist a good joke even if it's gonna kill me. Effectively. Well, look, and it's also a good way to figure out, you know, if it's somebody that you ultimately want to be with, because obviously they'd have to have a sense of humor. Um, I just discovered a question because I, um, so the question was the sacrifices being the life on the road um, uh, as far as stand-up goes. Yeah, but I think even more so, like, you're out, especially when you first start, you're out doing open mics and shows like five to six nights a week if you're taking it really seriously. Um, so there goes your social life with anyone that's not in comedy because they're, uh, you know, they might have dinner with friends. Like I've missed countless weddings and, you know, birthday parties, things of that nature. I don't really mind missing weddings if I'm totally honest, but that's because they're usually my parents. Um, <laughs> but like you, you lose friends, you lose relationships that I've been broken up with because, you know, a lot of guys don't want you to be out on the road with a bunch of dudes. Like sometimes I'm sharing a bedroom with a guy, like, because they're not going to spend extra money to bring a female opening act. So like, and if it's two guys, they just assume they'll share a room. So you, uh -huh. you have to be willing to deal. I've slept in my car. Um, I've had a lot of things happen to me that I'm sure if I weren't out late every night, wouldn't like uh, there was a, a shooting. I was standing right by the guy that got murdered. Like someone broke into my car and tried to steal it while I was in it. Like things like that. If I weren't out till one o'clock in the morning, most nights by myself, yeah, those things could happen, but there's a lot less likelihood, I think. Um, sure, I get what you're saying. I mean, you know, a, a lot of nights out in major cities, which yeah. then, you know have a certain crime ratio, um, you're going to experience some things and see some things that happen only, you know, after midnight. Yeah. And <laughs> it's funny, your parents always say growing up, nothing good ever happens after midnight. And I was always like, eh. and <laughs> they were right. <laughs> They were right. Um, but both of those things were must Hollywood, crazily enough. So uh, I was going to ask, um, are there places that you um, particularly like to perform or dislike to perform? 
Um, as far as clubs or states or countries or all of the above? Uh, I was thinking clubs, but even areas or regions around the country or world. Um, I do love performing in the UK because I think I still kind of inherently have that British sense of humor, even though I sound like this and I can be, I never talk about sex. I work pretty clean, but I can be very dark and they love that there. Whereas here it's a little trickier to get away with. They're much more PC about certain stuff. I don't do like racial stuff. That's not my jam, but I'll, I, like I said, I'll talk about death. Um, <laughs> as much as I'm allowed. Uh, I think in LA, the best club, probably in the country, my favorite club ever to perform at is the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach. Um, mm -hmm. If you ever get a chance to go down there, it is, they do a, just an incredible job. Like, I think part of it is they were, they treat the comics so well that like the energy there, everyone's happy to be there. The crowds are on fire. Like, it's sort of like an older Hollywood vibe. Like they have a lot of memorabilia and they do, it's almost like a dinner theater show. Um, and the owner and booker, Mike Lacey and Rich Barrett are just wonderful, wonderful guys. And they really, they get it. They know how to create the, not just the comedy show, but like the experience. And like, they don't even have to advertise. They don't, they don't pass comics as a paid regular on the basis of how famous you are. They don't give a fuck, which I, for me is great because I'm not famous, but like they pass you if you're funny and you have to be able to work clean. That doesn't mean you have to be clean when you work, but it is a good test because you'd be amazed how many comics can't work clean. Um, I think, uh, gosh, LA has the worst crowds that I've dealt with ever on the whole <laughs> in what sense um i guess it depends which part of it like technically comedy and magic is la but it like the south bay is sort of a different sure it's a different energy it's a different energy there's a lot less people in the industry and the problem with the hollywood shows um there's a lot of tourists and anytime you're dealing with tourists it's a little bit like vegas it's hard to get everyone on the same page because like they may not all speak english as a first language uh they in certain parts of the world one thing is funny where in another part of the world it's not you know right and you can't even like if you just go to north carolina you can kind of like you know you're gonna think, have the north carolina yeah right. like you're gonna know not to do Trump jokes probably. But like, not that I really do anyway, cause I don't wanna get shot. Um, <laughs> sure, but, but it's different when it's just a hodgepodge of people from anywhere, yeah, you, you, you can't know. isolate a region and maybe even rib them about something cultural specific. Like, exactly, exactly. And um, and then there's a lot of industry, which, you know, they're, they're to judge, like they don't laugh as much because they're being analytical about things, which, takes them out of the moment. And then uh, you also get a lot of like, you know, other aspiring actors or <laughs> like, I love, I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've said to someone in the crowd, oh, what, okay, what do you do? And they're like, I'm a model slash server. And I'm like, so I guess the modeling's not going great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, and look, we all have to have side jobs until you get to a certain point. I, I understand that. But like, though, there's a fair amount of those types of people that are so self-absorbed, I don't think they can listen. Um, and they tend to not be the best informed. Like you, not that I rely on a great deal of references just because they're, they tend to be time sensitive and you know that you, you're then only going to have a certain amount of time that you can do a bit, bit of material if that reference is going to become obsolete. Uh, but certainly I think, um, th those are the main factors. Uh, the comedy store I know is the legendary place, uh, that, um, that's sort of where most comics aspire to get past. I don't really perform there ever. Um, it's, it's come a long way and since they got a new booker, it's like really, it's getting a lot better, but it's also like misogyny central or it was and i've had some pretty not fun experiences including that shooting at the comedy store so that for me is enough reason to not really want to perform there anymore um i mean 
if I get a TV show and get past there, I would love to perform there, but I don't need to go do like the, the side room shows. Um, they also have a lot of bringer shows like on the off nights and the side shows. <laughs> And the bringer shows is something that I'm, I, I guess people probably don't all know what those are, but. Uh, a, a minimum requirement that each stand that brings a certain number of people. It, yeah, it's essentially like anyone can, it's sort of like pay to play, you know, maybe it's not you paying, you're actually tricking your friends into paying to go to a terrible comedy show, which is. I could never bring myself to do. It's a very tempting thing as a new comic because if you start in LA, it's it's the worst place to start because there's so little stage time and it's so competitive. You've got all the best comics in the world live here virtually. So like to get on any booked shows is really difficult. Um, and you know, you get hit up by these people. They they trick you sometimes. Like last year I had a woman hit me up and say like um you know do you want to do my show book me on the show and then the day before she's like could i have your guest guest list and i was like come again like <laughs> she's like I, I need to know your five people that are coming i'm like well i promoted the show i i always promote my shows but i was not aware this is a bringer show and if it is i'm not doing it thank you like because the way i see it is if that's the first show that an audience member ever sees the, their first stand-up show, they're never going to go back because even if it's peppered with, they usually throw in some good comics, some headliners, like in between all of the brand new people, but they're often three hours long, which is way too long for any kind of comedy show, whether it's a movie or whatever, you know, in my opinion, that's something my dad has definitely ingrained in me. But B, like they're literally paying to be miserable. It's not cheap to go to a stand-up show. You know, you're like the ticket price if it's 20 bucks and then you've got to do the two item minimums. So right there, you're probably looking at 40, 50 bucks a person. And, and parking. And parking, especially if it's at the comedy store, which good luck because that right. place is a nightmare to park. It's, uh, well, I grew up here. So, yeah. uh, and uh, I'm a comedian and all my friends were growing up. So I have paid my dues with <laughs> that uh, lineup. And, you know, look, when you're young and it's, uh, you know, and, and I really wanted to support my friends. So, I mean, I did it because I wanted to. I never did stand up, by the way. I do consider myself a comedian. I was just gonna ask. Through the filter of writing. Well, I did it one time, actually. And I did it with, um, I did a lot of sketch comedy and uh, a lot of improv. So that was the filter uh, through which I expressed. Um, and I did stand up one time uh, and I did it with a friend and we did it as two old people characters that we had done successfully on the stage. And uh, I will tell you that because I was playing a, an older gentleman completely out of touch with the times that I then did. My dad? <laughs> I did. Uh, so from his point of view, good stand, he got st his stand up off of uh, the internet. So it was just, it wasn't even the character's original stand up. He just got a list of really racist jokes off the internet and then told My dad? Me. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. And then my friend Susie Geyser, who played my wife, uh, she came and got me uh, uh, and started screaming at me, what are you doing, Marvin? I'm like, I told, I'm performing a tight five. And it turns out that I'd left her in a car. So ultimately, <laughs> it was really a sketch because right. everything was written that included the audience. And we killed. They thought it was hilarious. And uh, I looked at Susie when we were done and I said, I've done stand up, never again. It was a <laughs> success. I'm going to call it a day. Um, it, Smart, by the way. <laughs> I love the idea of standing behind a microphone and uh, owning the moment. And I know, I know how to, I know craftsmanship. So mm -hmm. I know I can make people laugh because. I, I know a lot of it is tone, personality, or sensibility, but I also know it's um, exact word construction. So I know I can pull that off, but I never wanted to do 
all of the things that you just listed. And part of the reason I went and saw my friends is because I did think about it, but yeah. I didn't want to be up at till midnight waiting for a turn for five minutes. I didn't want to bring people to sit for three hours to see me for five or three. Yeah. Uh, I just, it, it wasn't my jam. So I express myself in a lot of other ways and I have no judgment of anybody else who does decide to do it. It's just, I, I would love to have had the stage time. I'm not afraid of it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't, I kept looking at the path and I was going, is this the only way to become a headliner or at least a, a consistently paid comic? And at the time, that's what I saw. But I, it's m even more than that. I mean, the first probably four years, you're going to lose money doing it, basically. Like, it, it's that bad. <laughs> like, there's no union, probably, because there's a reason we do stand up. You know, it's like, it's maybe because. Well, that's not true because I've done sketch and improv. Like I love working with other people, but like I can't imagine a bunch of stand-ups trying to agree on a union set of rules. Like <laughs> just it, it, we're not cut out for that kind of compromise. So you know, I I wish that there were because it's abysmal what they pay. I mean, just to give you guys some idea, um, like it can take. The comedy store is one of the hardest places to get into and the, the only real routes that you can use to get in, you either get a TV show, and I think that's the faster route personally, and then you get famous and they, they pass you, or you work there for 10 years and hang out and sort of are uh, indoctrinated into that club and you get passed that way. But um, like, if it takes you 10 years or eight years, whatever, to get past at that club, like I believe on the weekdays for a original room spot, you get paid $15. I'm sorry, you meant to say 1500, right? <laughs> 15. I, I, it's a little different, you know, on the weekends, like I know that they do for the main room, main room shows, there's a door cut, like you're gonna make more money off of that. But the only, it's a real catch 22, like many things in this business. Like if you wanna make money, you have to go on the road. And even then it's not gonna be the best money. Maybe if you're headlining and you're already famous, but in this day and age, it's changed a lot because you really have to be famous before you can make a lot of money on the road. But like, if you're only doing stand up how do you get to that point? It's all about social media numbers and things like that. And for me personally, I, I hate that. Like, I don't really like social media. I do it because I have to, it makes me a little uncomfortable. I don't like self-promotion. It's like, and it's held me back. I mean, there's a lot of girls that, there, there's a lot of female comics who post bikini selfies and have 200,000 followers and they go headline, but I can't bring myself to do that. Um, so it it's a weird time for it right now, but like the upside, like I said before, I mean, I do book most of the work that I book as an actor, as a writer, producer, whatever, consulting, almost all of that goes because of my standup, because people know me from doing that. It's a good networking thing and yeah. Do you, have you, um, uh, uh, bringing us to this um, unique, moment we're living in, uh, in, in the pandemic times. Uh, have you done any virtual shows or? Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, there's, some, there's a few people that have figured out a really good system, like where they have like, they have someone moderating, but they'll have like 50 live mics. So you're getting that feedback, you're hearing laughter, mm -hmm. but, and that helps a lot. Um, but when, when everyone's muted uh, and you're just literally talking, like I might as well perform for my dog. He appreciates it more. At least he's like wagging his tail and like loves me. You know? He's like, mommy's talking to me. Yeah, he's yeah. thrilled. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I can't help myself but say yes, because I, I'm always writing and coming up with material. And to some degree, you can kind of show us Hercules. Okay, Hercules, come here. Shh. Come on. I'm gonna have to get up and go get him because he's like snuggled. He has a new bed 
Did I show you this before? It's amazing. Uh -uh. Hang on. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay. Good. You know, puppies and kittens, I, you know, they're there for us in trying times. Okay. I don't know if you guys can. <laughs> <laughs> this is Hi, the crab shack. Hi, baby. Hercules, who just woke up from a nap. Um, I wish I could say that his hair didn't always look like this, but it does. He looks so tight. Uh, this is a cat bed, but it, it may be the best 20 bucks I ever spent on Amazon because it makes me laugh all day long. <laughs> It's just yeah. such a weird a little crab shack, but. Is there some other toy in there behind him? What is that thing? Um, he's probably put his toys and bones. What do we have? Yep, his favorite yellow squeaky toy. Oh, hi. But he loves this little, <laughs> he's tiny. He's about seven pounds maybe. Uh -huh. um, his real name is Hercules. Just if you like terrible plays on words. <laughs> you punned your dog with your own last name? <laughs> well, I'm really good at naming animals. Did I ever tell I, I told know, you that. I, I wish there was more demand for it. I'd be a millionaire. But uh, <laughs> I used to live on a ranch. And um, I got a lot of practice because my dad would adopt these random animals. Like uh, uh -huh. we had two llamas. Their names were um, Dalai Lama and Komote Lama. <laughs> which come on that's the best llama name ever Those are good. it's so confusing especially the guy that worked for us was mexican and yeah i'd be like come on, can you go get como te llama and he's like juan and i'm like no 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 can I get, what's your name what's my yeah my name's juan uh so international i know and the alpacas were uh green bay paca <laughs> Overpaca and fudge, which my dad never figured out, but I think. <laughs> now, you you collaborate with your dad. So is that, how, what's that like? Um, it's great. I mean, I've been very fortunate to be able to work with and learn from him. Like for years we've worked together and uh, he's so good. Um, at what he does and what's interesting is he he's not trained in it really so it's all stuff that he's figured out as he's gone and he has no idea how much he knows that people don't inherently understand like about comedy it's amazing um like you'll get a kick out of this we're working on a rewrite with someone recently and the first draft is done and they brought my dad in and my dad and i in to do a rewrite and we were discussing it and the original writer um, said, was talking and said something about the break into three. And he's like, I'm sorry, what? And he's like, you know, the act break between act two and act three. And he's like, no, I don't know. And he's like, you don't know the acts? Nope, has no idea. Never has used that, never. And if you look at all of his great works, they're all broken into acts. It's just, I think if you have that innate ability to tell stories and you get the structure of a story, you don't really need to know, or like it breaks it down in itself. I think part of the reason they came up with that was to give more value to like getting an expensive degree in screenwriting or something. I don't know. I didn't know what it was either until like a year ago, but I made a point of laughing at my dad for not knowing because <laughs> It's fun. It's well, it's sure. It's always fun to poke fun at pops, but, right. um, but I love that story. And I think there's a lot to learn for, uh, you know, our guests for this conversation. Um, I, I didn't learn. I, I learned that later on too. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I teach writing as well as acting and, you know, it's that resonates with me because my storytelling character work, scene work, scripts that I've written, it it all came from a more organic place having to do with the story I told. And, and those things, those technical things that writing teachers teach seem to hash them out themselves if the story was good. Right. And 
not so much if it wasn't a great story to tell anyway. So it's funny, as I evolved as a teacher and grew into a writing teacher as well as a performance teacher, I made sure to include and acknowledge the, the, the terminology, the act breaks, the beat sheet, this, you know. It's important to know because you have to speak that language if you're going into pitch or whatever. And I had to learn on the fly because I had no idea, but like somehow managed to, I think, make it passable. Um, but it, I was a little embarrassed, but then I think if you're naturally a funny person, like you are there, if you know how to tell a joke or be funny, I think there's something that also makes you good at telling stories because stories are essentially just long jokes. Generally, if it's a funny story, if it's a sad story, not so much, obviously, but, um, but there's so many things that he's taught me that I never heard in any other acting class. I think primarily because almost every acting class is not focused on comedy. And if they do do comedy, they're not very good at teaching it, if I'm honest, like from my experience. Uh, because things that my dad will say right off the bat, you know, if you're writing, it's economy of words, like setting up jokes in the most um, clear and concise way that you can, but without giving away too much information so that the audience gets ahead of you, because then when you deliver the punch, obviously it's not going to be funny, like the, all those kind of technical things. But when it comes to acting, for example, he always says that repressed emotion is funny, whereas overt emotion is not funny. And I'd never heard that from anyone else. But if you watch, um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen Faulty Towers, but what makes Basil Faulty such a funny character is that he is so hard like trying so hard to hold it together like he's so angry all the time but like it's what's funny about him is the fact that he's trying to hold it in but if you heard someone just berating someone or being like really angry outright it's not funny like it, it's sort of like uh whereas that kind of repressed anger is hilarious Oh, someone says Faulty Towers is in fucking credible. Well, I'd like to say thank you, but I can't take credit. But it has been voted the one of the num you know top sitcoms ever. And again, they also something really interesting about that show. I I want to say every script was like sixty pages for a half hour. That's how fast the pacing of it was, and they would rehearse for like I want to say ten days to two weeks and shoot for half a day. Which so oh, the 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 final broadcast edit really included sixty pages. Um, I'm okay. sure they cut out little bits and pieces, but if you look at how quickly that whole it, they never stop moving. It's just pacing, pacing, pacing. It's same thing with um, a fish called Wanda. One of the things that you'll notice about that movie, which. And it's been interesting because I grew up on that set. I was like four and screaming because they're dangling my dad out of a fifth story window. And I'm like, mm -hmm. like, you don't understand that that's not real at that age and that they had to escort me off set. But coming <laughs> okay. back to it, like we're currently adapting it as a Broadway musical. And like, I've come to appreciate having read now so many comedies and seen so many comedies, like there is no fluff in that movie. There's not a single bit of gratuitous, just like, we're gonna be fun, like, okay. For example, Talladega Nights, I, the first 45 minutes of that movie, I laughed my ass off, but where's the plot? And then it's like at the end of 45 minutes, it's like they scramble to make up for the plot and it gets kind of boring because you're like, but wait, what about, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> eight pound, 10 ounce baby Jesus and all that stuff like that was so funny, but it's like a sketch. It's not telling a story. There's a lot of fluff in there. And I think Bill Goldman, I was fortunate enough to grow up, like he, William Goldman, who wrote uh, Butch Cassidy and um, Misery and Princess Bride. And he was like, if we were religious, he was my godfather, but we're not. So he, he just was sort of like a weird uncle that came on family vacations with us. But learning from him too, like he has a whole kill your darlings thing. Like sometimes you get so attached to something because it's so funny, but you have to be willing to let go of those things if it makes it better as far as pacing goes and stuff like that. Um, and like, it really made me appreciate that because 
uh, Fish Called Wanda is around 90 minutes. Every one of my dad's comedies around 90 minutes. Um, and like, you know, Judd Apatow movies are like two and a half hours sometimes. And look, I'm no Judd Apatow, but if I, I feel like you could take 15 seconds out of almost every single uh, scene in that and it would be a better movie. But it's like, they just, they keep like everything they think is funny in it but it makes it too long. You can only laugh for so long, in my opinion. And that's before the director's cut. Great comment. <laughs> I, Erin's uh, uh, on it. She's got her antenna up. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Oh my God, I love everything that you're saying. And what's fascinating about this moment, and I can't let it pass without mentioning it, is I think literally everything that you're saying, uh, just about comedy in general is so profound and it's happening while stuffed crab legs are in oh, the Oh yeah, I can't help them. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's perfect. Please don't be. And don't move it or change it. I just think it's, it's so it is funny. amazing. <laughs> um, I got to geek out about A Fish Called Wanda. You know, that movie was pivotal to me. And an, another thing that I'll say about it um, that I think puts it in the category of great films versus films that are okay, or especially, you know, I'm a snob about comedy too. And I, I'll laugh, I'll watch these other comedy movies and I, I'll laugh if something inspires me to laugh, but it's really hard to create a movie of any genre that's got several truly lead roles and you end up caring about all of the characters. You know, what Michael Palin did in that movie was amazing. You cared about Jamie Lee Curtis. You know what I mean? It's like so many movies are made uh, with one person as the linchpin and everybody else around them as a prop. And that always drives me nuts. Um, and A Fish Called Wanda for a 90 minute movie, I wanted to know what was happening with everyone. Yeah. And I think that's very hard to do when you're constructing. Incredibly hard, yeah. They did, I wanna say it was 18 rewrites, if that gives you any. And it shows, um, it's also like, it, gosh. I mean, I get like my skin crawls thinking about doing 18 rewrites of, every, of anything because you get to that point where you're like, I'm so sick of looking at this that, but it's always, you have those breakthroughs and when you really push to like those last couple of changes or whatever. And again, killing your darlings, like you may be really attached to something but it doesn't work to serve the overall benefit of the movie and you have to to then let go of it um and it's been interesting adapting it as a broadway thing because i'll say to my dad and like i know it's ballsy because i know he knows better than me don't get me wrong but i'll say i think we have to cut this and he'll like throw a hissy fit and then two hours later we come back from lunch and he's like i get it like because there may be something that you just love but um it just, it, it doesn't serve the benefit of the overall movie. And that's the hard thing about movies too, because it's like, if it's a TV show, you could save it for later. Or like, you know, there's a lot of different ways around it, but they actually wanted to make a TV show of A Fish Called Wanda. And their analogy was like doing what they did with Fargo, like sort of dragging the plot out over an entire series. And my dad and I were like, no, because <laughs> the whole thing is the pacing. Like, why are you going to then expand that over such a long thing? But there aren't many movies that have been nominated for as many Academy Awards that are comedies. I mean, usually comedy is just overlooked. And I, uh, which my is dad a was nominated for, um, for the screenplay, which I'm very grateful for because I get Academy screeners because he doesn't know that that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> He won't watch them anyway. Uh, and uh, Kevin Klein won for Best Supporting Actor. And that is such a rarity in the Academy Awards. Um, rare. Yeah. And he is incredible in that and many other things. I love him. But he was my first crush, by the way. He, what, he was <laughs> your first crush? When I was four. Yeah. Well, I mean, come on. I Funny, smart, talented. Yeah. Also 50 years too old. Or not 50, but a number of years too old. <laughs> Look, when you're at four, you have a free pass to just fall in love with anybody for any reason. Yeah. It's, it's, right? It's just you're four. 
But I think funny was always such an important thing to me. And that's been like the downfall of my dating life because I'll value that over <laughs> emotional stability or like <laughs> having a job. <laughs> Some of these things that like really would be more beneficial if I would. Um, I live in my car, but I'll crack you up. Okay. That's uh, I mean, I was, it never ceases to amaze me how many comedians and good comics that move here and they live in their car. Like, because that's, unless you're working, I mean, you guys all know like how hard it is to survive in LA, even if you have a full-time job. Well, doing stand-up where you essentially lose money until you're headlining, like it, it, it's incredible, but that's the dedication. That's like the obsession that people get with it. Um, and it is, it can be the best feeling in the world. Like when you're, able to make an entire room full of people laugh and just like the, the sort of joy that you feel and it's contagious and like I think one of my favorite sets ever this guy and I don't even know if it had anything to do with me like he started to lose it like and he had a very distinctive laugh um, and it was about the third sentence I said on stage and he started to laugh and he could not stop and it became, I literally did 15 minutes just about him. I was like, could you stop? You're distracting. Like, but it became funny to everyone else because he could not stop. And then it's amazing how the, the contagious, like it just spread throughout. And I've never seen so many people just crying, laughing. And I was, I was like, I'm not even doing anything. Like, can you guys come to all my shows? This is amazing. Like, can I just stand here for the next 10 minutes? But um, it can be a really magical thing. But the downside is for every one of those magical sets, you're going to have a lot of just horrific bombs. And like, like what I love is it's always a challenge. It's always new, but like I could do two shows in the same room, both sold out 8 PM and 10 PM. I could do the exact same set. And one of them I crush. And the next one is like crickets. And you're like, how did I stop being funny in an hour? Like, it, it does mess with your head. It, that's where I think it's a little masochistic, but again, sure. there's just so many variables. But you know, it, it, it is it, like, there's a chemistry that is created with an audience that is no different than, you know, like a dating and romantic chemistry. And then also sometimes the chemistry is good, but the audible laughter isn't there. And one of the things that I've had to learn as a, a, a comedian, and I brought it into being a, a uh, an audition technique, an on-camera teacher uh, as well, because I learned it through casting, is this state of being where you are creating comedy, you're producing comedy, and whether you're doing it well or not, there is no laughter to greet it. Because right. on single cam, on multi cams where there's an audience, there's the expectation that they will laugh, and they usually do because they're in a good mood. Um, or but there's on, a sign that says laugh or something, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but but they do. I've I've yeah. been to so many tapings. It's pretty authentic because they're jazzed. Yeah. But on single cams, you're supposed to produce comedy and nobody laughs. In auditions, you're supposed to produce comedy if it, that's the genre and nobody laughs. Um, and then I've also done, even though I didn't do stand up, I've done written sketch shows that had two shows on the same night and the eight o'clock killed and the 10 o'clock died. And yeah. you're like, literally what? And I'm more awake at 10 o'clock than eight anyway. Right. And warmed up. So you're yeah. like, what happened to this show? And that's what's amazing. But it, it can be that like, you know, the audience that you get at 10 p.m. if it's especially on a Friday night are notoriously more difficult because if well maybe not in LA so much because there's much less 95 kind of work weeks here but like they're tired at a 10 p.m. show or they've already drank too much that's a common one on the later shows but even something like you know how does the comic before you do are you gonna have to spend the first five minutes like winning the audience back because they're so uncomfortable after what just happened or if a waitress drops a tray of drinks like that's a great way for your set you have to win them back because they get uncomfortable for you you know and you have to sort of find ways it's learning how to deal with all those variables but there are some nights unquestionably where you just can't figure it out like no matter what um 
maybe you were not as connected to what you're saying because yeah there to some degree there's improvising in the stand-up but like i generally know pretty much what i'm going to say when i get up well that's not true like i usually write out a set list and then completely abandon it and do whatever <laughs> because i think the longer that you do it the more that you tailor it to the crowd like if they laugh at this joke i'm like okay i know that this is going to work for them or not um well, that's what, you know, great polished comedians do that, again, maybe that the audience doesn't see all the hours you put in so you can get to the point, and it is the same even with improv and sketch to a certain degree, is have go in with a great plan, but mm -hmm. now you have enough skill and experience it to alter it literally on the fly before their eyes. And, it, and if you're doing it well, it's feeling to them like that's the, that was the exact plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it should, it should always, I mean, on one hand, it's supposed to look like we're organically making these things up as we go along. And I wish that any of us were that funny, but the reality is, yeah, it's most of it, unless we're working out new material, which generally you're gonna do sort of bit by bit, like I'll do a bit that I know works so the audience is on board. And then once they're laughing, I'll start trying out new stuff and I'll do a few lines. And like, as long as they're still laughing, I'll keep going. But then when I start to feel them getting away from me, I'll go back to doing another bit of material that I know will bring them back and so on and so forth. Um, do you, do you have, and I'm totally putting you on the spot. You can blow me off, feel free. But do you have a favorite joke or a go-to joke that, I have a, a few uh, that I that are kind of savor like um, I'm six foot one which you may not be able to tell from me sitting down but like I have tons of height material and and it's self-deprecating so if there's any question that they're not liking you or they think you're an asshole that's like which that happens enough for, for me because some of my material can be a little dark like it's a great way to to bring them back and i just talk about like um for example <laughs> i get the dumbest comments made about my height like people just walk up to me all day long and they're they're like you're tall which i know you know so to stop myself from punching them in the face like <laughs> and this is all true by the way it's not just a bit but like i i had this creepy drunk guy come up to me after a set and use probably the worst pickup line you can ever use on a really tall girl. He's like, damn girl, you're really tall. So I was like, not for a man, which works a lot better when my voice isn't cracking. Um, but like, he pulled it up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, he, and he went away. But like that kind of a thing is pretty, pretty fail safe. Uh, also about my parents, like I have, any of the like the one liner quick jokes too are a great way to bring them back. Like I can say, I'd, I'd love to be like my parents. They're incredible. They've been married for like almost 42 years now to seven different people. Uh, <laughs> so like that's a quick way to, to get back to it. Um, yeah. So. They made me laugh. So mission accomplished. That, that's why they're the go-tos. Yeah. Well, there's, I have probably 10, depending on what I'm talking about at that given moment. Um, I, I have a favorite bit that I think just because it's one of the most clever things I've written, and I don't think I've ever written anything more clever, but that's a longer bit. But I know going into it, it's not going to be laughs off the bat because I get them really wound up and uncomfortable before the reveal, which is my favorite thing to do if you can pull it off because when when they're in a state of tension the laugh is that much bigger it's like why when you watch an action movie and you're on the edge of your seat and they make a joke it could it may not even be a good joke but it makes you laugh because it releases that tension you know um i do know I, you know you you wouldn't know this unless i told you so i'm gonna tell you mm -hmm. you're you have uh, eviscerated my list of questions that I had for you, because just having a conversation with you, you answered so many, and I mean it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean that in the best way. You're, I, I could talk to you about comedy and what it means 
forever because you're so astute and you have such a sophisticated take in every time we've actually had many conversations just about comedy yeah the dynamic well, we're both obsessed with it kind of i think it's fair to say comedy and, and it always boils down you know in my opinion to heart and humanity yeah it, it, that i sense from you because and i know i feel that way about it but it's um you know the like the construction of words and all of that is great but it doesn't mean so much if there's not something soulful and intentional underneath it, I think. Oh, absolutely. And I think a lot of it comes like, you know, there's people always say, and I think it's commonly known, at least in, amongst the comics, like most people come from pretty fucked up childhoods and like it comes from a place of pain. It's a defense mechanism. It's a way to make people like you when, you know, I think I went to 10 schools before I graduated high school and I had to find a way to make people like me, you know? Um, and I got bullied a lot and like, it was a way to, to deal with that because if you can make people laugh, that's the best way to, to connect with people. Um, even if you're making fun of yourself or whatever. And the, there's a fine line that like, it's hard to watch sometimes with newer comics, they'll be self-deprecating, but to the point of it being like, like uncomfortable. Um, but you learn sort of where that line is, I think from, you know, just doing it and learning. Like I said, like you wouldn't believe the number of mics and like I've done, I've been on stage thousands of times um, at this point. And still sometimes like I, I went and did I did a live show for the first time in about, God, I guess March to August, however many months that is. Uh, and it was with a socially distanced audience and it was also live streamed on Facebook, but just to have those people there was really exciting. But I got so nervous going up. Like, I couldn't believe how nervous I got. For someone that's been on stage a thousand times, I felt like it was my first time going back out there just because you feel like it's such a muscle, like doing stand up in particular, that I was like, oh my God, what if I'm not funny anymore? Like, I've basically been at home talking to my dog for the past four or five months. Like, how I don't even know how to put sentences together anymore. Um, but the second I got that first laugh, it was like, okay, we're good. And just cruise through it. Um, sure. Well, so listen, uh, I want to give them an opportunity to ask a few more questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's, before... there's one up here that I meant to, I'm going to answer it live because it'll be quicker than me typing this, but uh, mm -hmm. somebody asked, uh, what are some of your favorite Zoom mics, i.e. the least terrible ones, which is a good way of putting it because most of them are miserable. Like open uh, mic on Zoom, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, and uh, I do not know, but if you want to send me a message on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, I will find out. Um, I've only done the shows, which are just as terrible on the whole, um, but I, I do know who to ask that question, so I can certainly find out for you. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, I do, before we get to any more questions, I do have a part of the format of Chattable is a speed round. Ooh. So with a game show-esque quality. So I do have seven questions for you that are very stimulus in response and we just go really quick. Are you up for that? Yeah. Okay. I think, so, I mean, let's. They're not gotcha questions. It's just, right. it's just interesting. So whatever comes out, comes out. Here we go. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. Three, two, one. What does comedy mean to you? Everything. If you could change one thing about the industry, what would it be? That they wouldn't book people off social media numbers. Do you think of yourself as successful? Getting there. What's a funny word? Cantaloupe. <laughs> it is. What's more important, self-expression or true respect from your peers? Self-expression. Is there anyone not invited to your funeral? I, 
I can't think of anyone that wouldn't potentially be dead before me, so no. <laughs> That's a very practical answer. All right, is there anything you can think of every human being on the planet has a responsibility to do? Have empathy and be a good person. Thank you. The speed round is over. See, that wasn't painful, I hope. Uh, <laughs> All right, good. It's just the way to, you know, just to, you know, handle things a little bit differently. All right, folks, um, are there any other questions that you would like to pose to our fabulous, funny, and thoughtful guest? I love the way your brain works, I have to say. Thank you, keep going. <laughs> if we do, I can talk to you about comedy uh, forever. Um, if we don't, I, I think if we don't have any questions is because you did such a thorough job of talking about life in stand-up, particularly as a woman doing comedy. Um, <laughs> you can ask a question as a host, can you? I'm a host. Yeah, Erin, you can ask anything. Come on. What do you got? Na 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 na. Are you are you going to? Not through Q and A. I meant. Okay. Yes. You can unmute. What is the thing that most surprises you about writing a musical? Well, that is a good question. So that regarding is a good question, the Wanda adaptation. Well, first of all, I never fucking thought I'd be writing a musical in a million years, especially not with the least musical person on the planet, aka my dad, who, just to give you some examples, uh, someone asked him his favorite genre of music. He said silence. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, and I love music. I grew up, I played four, in four instruments growing up, like, you know, I wish I could sing, not my thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, he really does, like the only album I've heard him play on purpose was, uh, it's Randy Newman, like he loves Randy Newman. But like, we went to dinner once at Sundance, this is quite a few years ago, and I'm totally name dropping now, but it was like, so, just to back up, we started writing this 10 years ago. It's one of the first projects I ever worked on with him. And then MGM wanted to do the TV show. So it got put on hold and then they finally gave up on the TV show. So here we are 10 years later. Um, and we were at dinner with Kevin Bacon, uh, Kyra Sedgwick, Sting, a bunch of other famous people. And I was, I was a wallflower basically, but when we let, my dad had mentioned the musical and Sting was like, oh, I would love to write a song for that. And I'm like sitting there shaking. I'm so excited. And we leave. And as we're walking home, he says to me, have you had Sting's music? And I'm like, yeah, is it, is it good? I was like, have you not heard any of Sting's <laughs> like that's how out of touch he is which it's been a little bit frustrating because we're we're trying to find the right person to do the music and lyrics and um i want sarah Bareilles to do it i don't know if i'm saying her name right but i think she's incredible and yeah, also sure. because i would love to have another like younger female involved as opposed to you know of course it's me and like five old old men uh, that are co currently working on this. Um, but then it's interesting adapting it for the stage because it's such an intimate movie anyway. It adapts really nicely, but having to consolidate scenes has been one thing, you know, so you're not dealing with all the set changes because obviously you can't cut from one thing to the next. Um, sure. Well, my big question is how are you handling, handling the steamroller? <laughs> That got ruled out pretty early on. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, that's, but, that's what's been flowing through my ticker. So a funny story, uh, when, when my dad and Charlie Crichton first sat down, and he was the director who has since passed away, but they sat down um, to write this movie. They were like, well, what should it be about? And I, I forget what Charlie's thing was, but my dad just said, I want to run someone over with a steamroller. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so that was like one of the first 
<laughs> first ideas for the whole movie, but we came up with something that involves a helicopter um, that I think kind of does the same thing, um, which hopefully we can work out because we figured it just goes up and down. Uh, there's a way to do that on stage. Look, they put a copter into Miss Saigon. That's where we got, one. yeah. We figured if they could do it back then, we can probably figure that one out. Um, awesome. Then my dad's trying to write the songs right now, which is really, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but it's just, his lyrics are so funny. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, I hate the Brits. They really are the pits. They're just the shits. Like, it's like the most basic rhyme scheme oh. in the world. He would murder me for saying that, but. But there we have it. Oh, well, let's look at this question from Shira, and then I think we can um, wrap for today. I'm trying to keep these timely, in, you know, in a timely fashion. But she says, any insights or memorable moments about developing the specificity of your comedic voice? How do you find your comedic voice? It's one of the things that I think I help people do. Um, I would say that definitely. I think being in your classes and, and the archetypes, is that what you call them, the, yeah. the characters? Um, like yeah. Realizing that, because a lot of the stuff I was going out for when I first started um, was like, well, when 10 years ago, it was like, you know, model-esque blonde or like party girl or whatever. And then now I, for whatever reason, um, apparently, because I have resting bitch face, uh, I go out for Russian assassin. <laughs> it's like the most... <laughs> It's so weird. <laughs> I don't know. But like, I think for me, it was hard because I started out writing for my dad. And so I had his voice in my head all the time when I was writing even my own stand up. And I'm like, wait, I can't say indeed in a joke. That's going to look very weird because that's not how I, um, how I would speak. And I actually can't ever ask him for help with my stand up because the way that he writes is so sort of uh eloquent and structured and you don't if it sounded that formal it wouldn't be stand up in a way like you it's right. supposed to sound impromptu and like if you look at me you don't expect me to to throw words like anti-disestablishmentarianism into my like <laughs> until you I, yeah exactly i've got to find a joke where i can say that now um, but it's taken me longer, I think, than some other people, because although I know how to write jokes and I know how to be funny to find a very specific point of view, it was harder for me, I think, to narrow it down to some degree because I'd written for him and I have his voice constantly critiquing me in the back of my head, whether I like it or not. Um, well, it's so this question. I sorry, one just popped up and distracted me. But yeah. I hope that sort of answers it. But then no, I, learning from you that I was more the eccentric, like the oddball <laughs> type, um, and realizing that I could play that, which isn't something that I think I would necessarily be cast at just looks wise. Uh, that helped me realize, like, oh yeah, I can be this sort of weirdo. I don't have to fit into what casting sort of. Uh, put me in that box, you know? Yeah, no, no, I know what you mean. Uh, all right, so this will be the last question. Uh, can you talk about the inequality of men and women in comedy? Oh my gosh, that's a pretty big I'll question. try and keep it short, but um, it's fucking brutal. Uh, and I think one of the biggest things you may have noticed, I mean, up until these past couple of months when there have been some of the Me Too accusations, like before that, the only male comic that was accused of anything is Louis. And still, I think it's unfair to lump him in with the wine steams of the world because there's a big difference in my book between pervert and predator. And I think he's more of a pervert than a predator, but enough about that. Uh, you there's a reason that not many of the male comics were you know had allegations made about them because there's a lot that deserve it and i know that but like in our world it's so male dominated like the guys that run the clubs are men and it's a boys club and if you complain you just won't get booked and that's the sad reality of where we're at still like 
I was talking to someone the other day and they were blown away. They didn't realize this. And I didn't know that it was a thing because it's sort of unspoken. But if you're a female headliner, you cannot bring a female opener on the road with you. Like you have, it has to be a guy. Like that's how, and you know, they say women aren't funny. Well, if you looked at the percentage of male comics that are funny versus the percentage of female comics, I think it would be the same. But the reality is there's just far less female comics because in that first year, when you start out and you're going to open mics, you'll notice it's like maybe 65, 35 male, female. Then the second year, it probably drops to about 80, 20. And then, you know, year three or so, I'd say it's, it's almost like 95, five. Um, because I mean, it's that hard to deal with. Like, you're not only dealing with sexual harassment, the the discrimination, but on the flip side, I hate when they have like an all female show lineup because it feels like the Special Olympics. Like they're doing it, like I don't wanna be given a spot just because I'm a female. Like I wanna be booked because I'm funny. I wish they would stop saying female comic. It should just be comic and like book the funniest people. Um, that's sort of the the quick answer, but it, I try to channel that into me making, sorry, that energy and the frustration with what we deal with and the sexual harassment and all that. Uh, I just channel that into working harder. I'm wanting to prove them wrong more rather than taking it personally because I know everyone deals with it and, and I'm determined to prove them wrong. And you are and will and do. Um, ferocious. Um, you know, I, I can't even wrap my head around people still in 2020 saying or even thinking or behaving in any way that women are not as as men. I've lived my lifetime laughing women from Roseanne to Joan Rivers to Phyllis Dill Like, women being hilarious yeah. is not new. No. I, I don't know what's wrong with people's brains in that regard. Well, there's also the whole like growing up, I think women aren't supposed to be funny. There's still sort of this thing where like, oh, you're not feminine if you're outspoken and funny, like it, it won't be attractive to men. That's sort of what I grew, I, I got that feeling growing up, but uh, sorry, I was just reading a, a, one of the comments, um, but yeah, I think we're finally getting to the point where it's overcoming that. But at the same time, like I said, I don't ever want to be booked because I'm a female. Like I want to be booked because I'm funny. And that's where it, it continues to be a struggle a little bit. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for your frankness. Um, I have one thing before you go. I thought when I, uh, you know, designed our format for Chattable, which is pretty much just a conversation which we had, and thank you for it. Um, but these are a box of power thought cards from Louise Hay. So they are uh, insightful and inspirational. And at the end of each chat, I give somebody one. So I'm just going to flip through these and at a certain point say stop. Stop. Okay. So this is where we stop. So this is your card for today. In my belief system, the universe wanted you to hear this. So I experience love wherever I go. Love is everywhere and I am loving and lovable. Loving people fill my life and I find myself easily expressing love to others. So that's for you today. Oh, thank you. If you want to feel that way, don't go into stand up. <laughs> They're also a setup for comedy. Louise Hay is funnier than I think she thinks she is. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that is our chatable for today. I do thank you sincerely and from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I think you are a unique and special comedic voice in the world. I love how you perceive and think about and respect comedy. So um, thanks for being a guest on our Chattable show. Thank you and, for having me. And thanks to everybody who joined us. So um, Saturday, uh, I will be chattabling with uh, Miss Elaine Hendricks, who plays Alexis Carrington on CW's Dynasty. So uh, that's very exciting. And um, I will be talking to you soon, I hope, okay? I hope so, certainly. All yeah. right.
Uh, take care. Thank Have a good day. Thank you guys for listening. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you.